Fighting officer came here with that intent, and so do I. So does Dr. Coburn. And there are a bunch of us who feel that way. Let's just do it. Thanks so much, Mr. President. With that, I will uh, uh, ask for a uh, note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. We heard a Senator Coburn talking a short time ago about the nation's borrowing limit. Now, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew will testify about the debt ceiling before the Senate Finance Committee tomorrow, which will be live uh, starting at 8 a.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN 2. And if you can't watch tomorrow morning, well, I'll have the hearing again tomorrow night at 8 Eastern over on C-SPAN. Veterans Affairs Secretary Eric Shinseki was on Capitol Hill today talking about the effect of a longer term government shutdown. Uh, he says that about 3.8 million veterans will not receive disability compensation next month if the shutdown continues into late October. Some 315,000 veterans and 202,000 surviving spouses and dependents will see pension payments stopped. Uh, that hearing before the House Committee on Veterans Affairs is airing right now on C-SPAN and again at about 9.15 Eastern on C-SPAN or anytime at cspan.org. Mr. President, Senator from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, pending before the Senate is a um, unanimous consent agreement on HCON Res 58, a bill to urge the Department of Defense to allow military chaplains to perform duties during the shutdown. Uh, earlier today, I objected to this bill because I misunderstood its purpose. And I'd like to withdraw that objection at this time. The bill will urge the Department of Defense to allow military chaplains, including contract personnel, to perform religious services during the shutdown and permit services to take place on property owned by the Department of Defense. Today, just as the Department of Defense and the administration solved the, the problem with military families and their death benefits, uh, upon the, the loss of one of their loved ones serving our country, um, I urge, and, and I know others will as well, urge the DOD to ensure that all active duty members are able to exercise their First Amendment, uh, their, their First Amendment rights, I should say, and participate in religious ceremonies while they're serving. So that's something I hope we can, we can resolve. Mr. President, I also wanted to raise some issues that relate to the shutdown. Uh, I've, I raised some earlier, but these are additional concerns that I have uh, with regard to the shutdown. The, the impact of this shutdown is being felt across the board, across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and indeed across the country. It's felt um, by small businesses. Uh, states and municipalities are feeling it already and are anticipating uh, much more of an impact uh, as time goes by, and of course families are feeling it very acutely. Yesterday I sent a letter to Speaker Boehner emphasizing the detrimental impact that the shutdown is having on 
uh, my constituents in Pennsylvania. Just by way of a couple of examples that apply to both Pennsylvania and the nation. Domestic violence programs across the country have been impacted directly by the shutdown. The offices that oversee grants under the Violence Against Women Act have had to shut down and are not able to issue grants and, or provide reimbursements to local uh, programs. And I'd say parenthetically that it took many, many months for the Violence Against Women Act uh, reauthorization to go forward. There's a, a lot of problems along the way, a lot of objections. And fortunately, we, we got the uh, program reauthorized. And now, because of the shutdown, you're having problems with um, women who are victims of service or the victims of violence getting the services that, that they are entitled to. We're hearing as well from, from folks in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania domestic violence shelters that rely upon federal funds and who have already been in, impacted by the sequester, the across the board indiscriminate cuts that have been in effect since March. Uh, the, these shelters may, may have to further reduce services uh, to vulnerable victims of domestic violence. In the words of one state advocate, quote, and this is, these are her words, we are hanging on by our fingernails, unquote, meaning hanging on just in terms of being able to provide services with funding either limited or funding being, being uh, jeopardized. Women trying to escape abusive relationships should not be hampered by uh, the failures here in Washington uh, to end this shutdown. In terms of Social Security, we know that, that Social Security checks are going out, uh, fortunately, but on average in Pennsylvania, 2,900 new claims are processed each week. That's the, the typical uh, weekly total for new, for new claims. This means that Pennsylvanians who have reached retirement age and have paid into the system their entire careers are now, are now forced to wait for benefits. You have to ask yourself, why should a domestic violence uh, center, uh, the people that work to prevent domestic violence and, or, or to help the victims, uh, why should they have to wait for a political uh, dispute uh, where you have one wing of one party engage in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in a, um, uh, an ideological uh, exercise that allows a government shutdown, and therefore that domestic violence center doesn't get the help that it needs, and the women, and mostly women, who are impacted don't get the help they need. The same could be said of someone who reaches retirement age and expects and has, has a right to expect that their Social Security um, eligibility will be processed. Why should they have to wait uh, for Washington? In Pennsylvania alone, when it comes to small businesses, 30 loans on average are made each week by the SBA for a total of $13 million each and every week. The loss of these loans is hindering entrepreneurs from growing their business and from obtaining much needed capital. Again, why should a business owner, who a small business person who gets help from the SBA and has an expectation of getting that help and that we average 30 of those loans every week in Pennsylvania, amounting to $13 million. Why should that all be stopped because someone in Washington has an ideological point to make? It makes no sense, and it's an outrage. The shutdown is also impacting infrastructure and public lands across the country. Until the government is open, uh, the maintenance of our nation's uh, basic infrastructure uh, is, is impacted. In Pennsylvania, a lot of that basic infrastructure involves involves our waterways. The locks and dams, that whole system, which is in place for Pennsylvania and many other states, um, the, the, the maintenance of those locks and dams is deferred. And we all know what happens when you defer maintenance on something as fundamental as uh, infrastructure. I've been informed that repairs that were scheduled to take place on locks along the lower Monongahela River in western Pennsylvania are suspended. If you have a problem with, with, those, uh, with a lock, uh, and locks and dams generally, but in particular focusing on the Monongahela River, uh, you stop the flow of commerce or you slow it down substantially. And when, you, when you slow down or stop the flow of commerce, that affects jobs in the economy of 
southwestern Pennsylvania. If just one of these locks were to fail, it could have a detrimental economic impact on the whole region. How about national parks? We've heard a lot about that topic this week and, and last week. The closure of national parks is negatively impacting Pennsylvania's economy. According to the National Park Service, the communities and uh, businesses surrounding Pennsylvania's national parks and memorials are losing up to $5.7 million in spending uh, by non-local visitors for each week that the government remains closed. That is just national parks and just in Pennsylvania, uh, almost $6 million. And that's just uh, the beginning of what can be a much more substantial and detrimental impact to the state's economy. So I'd, I'd go back to the, the point that I've made several times, and all of, us have, all of us have made these arguments in different ways. But w we know for sure that there's a, a very simple way out of this predicament for Washington, but more importantly for the country. And that's to, for the speaker to put on the floor a bill which both parties now agree will pass. It's, it's a clean funding bill. All it does is fund the operations of the government, albeit at a much lower level, $70 billion less than our side wanted. We compromised greatly at the beginning of this process, despite what some have said. So we have compromised to make sure that we can fund the government. It's about time for the speaker to put this bill on the floor they can vote on it very quickly. It would pass very quickly. It's only 16 pages long. And that is the key to resolving uh, and ending uh, this Tea Party shutdown. Uh, I'd urge the speaker to do that. I've urged him, and we all have in, in various ways. And we re respectfully suggest that that could happen uh, tomorrow. Um, Thursday would be a good day to end all of this so we can get people back to work. We can have the functions of government operating in such, to such an extent that the economy can grow. And we can uh, have a lot of debates and a lot of discussions about how to fund the government long term or what to do about our fiscal challenges, what to do about a whole range of issues. But uh, it's time for uh, the government to open. And it's time for the House to act to do that. It's also time to make sure that we pay our bills. And thirdly, it's important that we uh, continue uh, to negotiate, just as we negotiated a long time ago, many weeks ago, to reach the point where we could have a, uh, a bill that would fund the operations of the government. Some people in the House chose to take a different path, which led to shutdown. It's about time that we get them back on the right path, uh, which is to open the government, pay our bills, and then have negotiations and discussions and, and compromises to move the country forward. So with that, Mr. President, I would um, yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Should I? Okay. Clerk will call the roll. Charlie Fander. President? Senator from, Phil from Pennsylvania. I would ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to consideration of S-Res 267, which was submitted earlier today. The clerk will report. S-Res 267, relative to the death of Rod Graham, former United States Senator for the state of Minnesota. Without objection, the Senate will proceed to the measure. I ask the unanimous consent the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, and the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Without objection. I understand that there are four measures at the desk, and I ask for their first reading on block. The clerk will read the title of the measures for the first time. H.J. Res. 84, making continuing appropriations for Head Start for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. H.J. Res. 89, 
making appropriations for the salaries and related expenses of certain federal employees during a lapse in funding authority for fiscal year 2014 and so forth and for other purposes. H.J. Res. 90, making continuing appropriations for the Federal Aviation Administration for year 2014 and for other purposes. H.J. Res. 91, making continuing appropriations for death gratuities and related survivor benefits for survivors of deceased military service members of the Department of Defense for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. I now ask for a second reading on block and I object to my own request on block. The objection is heard. The, uh, the measures will be read for a second time on the next legislative day. I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today it adjourn until 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, October 10th, 2013, and that following the prayer and pledge, the morning hour be deemed expired, the journal of proceedings be approved to date, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day, and that following any leader remarks, the time until 1 p.m. be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, and that at 1 p.m. the Senate recess subject to the call of the chair to allow for a special caucus meeting with the president. Without objection. Mr. President, if there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it adjourn under the provisions of SRES 267 as a further mark of respect to the memory of the late Senator Rod Grams of Minnesota. The Senate stands adjourned until 10.30 a.m. on Tuesday, October 10, and does so as a further mark of respect to the memory of the Honorable Rod Grams. Senators continued to come to the floor today to talk about the government shutdown and the debt ceiling, of which the Treasury Department says the U.S. will hit a week from tomorrow. On the other side of the Capitol, in the House, lawmakers passed two limited funding bills, one providing survivor benefits to military families and another to keep the FAA funded through December 15th. The House has passed 13 of those mini spending bills, with the Senate passing one, continuing to pay military personnel during the shutdown. You can follow the Senate live here on C-SPAN 2 when numbers gamble back in. And tomorrow, 